Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, welcome back to another video and today I'm finally doing that video I've been so excited to make. So if you've watched any of my videos recently, I've probably mentioned at some point how I've been playing the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Now I'm going to make a video about my general like time playing it and my experience because I've never played Mass Effect before I got the Legendary Edition and I always wanted to and I'm going to, you know, there's a whole thing. I mean everyone knows that Mass Effect originally didn't come out on PlayStation so PlayStation players always kind of suffered in terms of being able to play it and I never did but I always wanted to and you know that way when you've been waiting so long and you finally get the opportunity to do something and you're like what if it doesn't live up to like what I've pictured in my head but genuinely playing Mass Effect has been one of the greatest experiences of my life. I have enjoyed every second. It has been like I've been in a period of mourning since I finished it a few days ago because it's like I feel like there's this massive hole in my life like I just spent so much time with these people and now they're gone and it's like I, I don't know what to do anymore I don't know I don't know what to do with my life do I just go back and start again will I ever be able to play another video game I haven't finished I haven't done the Horizon Zero Dawn DLC but can I ever put it on again or is I'm just gonna sit there and go well this isn't Mass Effect <laughs> It's the same problem I have when I finish The Witcher 3. Every game I put on after that, I'm like, it's good, but it's not The Witcher. <laughs> I'll go. I'll do a video where I'm just going to talk about Mass Effect and about my opinions and just everything and the choices I made and all that stuff. But first of all, I've been really excited to make this video, so I want to do it first. Um, we are ranking all 19, technically, of Shepard's squad mates in the Mass Effect trilogy and I'm gonna rank them in order you know from my least favourite to my most favourite uh, because if we went the other way then that would be boring. Uh, in the interest of, of clarity I'm not including anyone who was not like a proper Normandy uh, crewmate who was only there for DLC missions. By that I mean I'm not including Arya, I'm not including Noreen, uh, Dr. Amanda Kenson, anyone like that who was just there for specific missions. Don't count. Obviously not poor Jenkins from the first game, he doesn't count. Um, I'm also not including Morinth because she was never one of my squad mates, like I never recruited her um, and I think that would be pointless to include her because I spent very little time with Morinth and even if you do recruit Morinth from what I've heard like it's not really that exciting because she just pretends to be Samara and has the same dialogue so like don't know what they were doing with that one. I honestly don't remember I don't know if I looked away from the screen and missed like an interrupt or something but I don't remember ever being given the choice between Samara and Morinth. I don't know if it was because maybe I was just so paragon but like I don't know I don't remember ever having that option but um, nobody that was just there for specific missions. Everyone else is fair game. So let's get on with it shall we? So coming in at number 19 on the list is Jacob Taylor. <laughs> now in fairness I feel bad for Jacob. I feel bad for his actor. Um, because he was really done dirty by the writers and Jacob is definitely someone who's poorly written and it's a shame because hardly anyone in Mass Effect is poorly written like the characters are so wonderful and so rounded and they feel so real and like you feel like you've got a genuine connection with them and then there's Jacob <laughs> who just feels like the most boring bland useless guy who's ever kicked around my ship. Jacob has some definite unfortunate implications and I am going to address that because I don't want to just put him straight in at the bottom and not acknowledge the fact that he is completely done dirty um, and that it looks really bad. I feel bad for putting him in the bottom but it's like it's not my fault that the writers treated him like shit and I don't really feel there's anywhere else he can go on my list because I just don't like him or care about him. So Jacob is the most boring person who's ever been a squad mate ever. In Mass Effect. He has no real personality, he's just like Mr. Generic Bland Gunman. Like he can fire a gun and he's relatively nice most of the time. 
but he also manages to be one of the cringiest people if not the cringiest person in the game because of his terrible romance scene with Shepard in the second game. Now, I never romanced him because why the hell would I? But um, obviously that footage exists. I finally saw that scene and oh my god, it's so embarrassing. I actually was sitting like this like while watching it. He just shows up at the door and he's, he's like, uh, what is it? He says, heavy risk but the prize. <laughs> Like, shut the fuck up, Jacob. And I got really annoyed because I felt like my shepherd sounded flirty every time she talked to him. And I'm like, I just want to chat to my crewmate. Stop flirting with him. Like, I don't like this man. I, think I do not give you permission to flirt with this man. Jacob is the only character in the entire series who can actually cheat on you when you're in a romance. And not just can, but will. There is no way for them to end up with a happy relationship. They will break up because he will cheat on her. Which is massively depressing, considering nobody else does that. And more than that, it's obviously terrible implications because Jacob is also the only black squad mate in the entire series. And there is something really bad about the one black character being the character who cheats on his partner. Not just, not just cheats on her, but cheats on her and gets the other girl pregnant. So the girl, the woman that he cheats on Shepherd with ends up pregnant with his kid and there's some really bad stereotype there about, about black men and commitment issues and bad fathers and all that kind of stuff. And if you play and you don't romance Jacob, he actually comes off a lot better because he's just a nice guy, you meet up with him on whoever the heck he is and he's like, hey Shepherd, good to see you and she's like, good and then she like congratulates him and shakes his hand because he's going to be a father and he's really excited about it and he's so, you know, he's so happy he's, he's going to be a dad and he's going to have a family and he really loves this girl and it comes across really well but then knowing that he also has this flip side where he's just a total dick and cheats on Shepherds and his justification is that he never thought he would see Shepherd again and I'm like, I find that hard to believe considering you live in a universe where it's super easy to travel not just like around the world but between worlds like it's easier to catch up with someone in Mass Effect across the entire Mil Milky Way than it is to currently see your partner if you live on Earth like not because of Covid but just in general you could have come to Earth to track her down when she and tried to help her when she was imprisoned you could have called her, you've got a vidcom link to like the entire world, everybody can communicate with everyone else, and everybody meets up on the Citadel, you can find him later on in the Citadel and it's like, so you just actually put in absolutely zero effort to try and track down Shepard and continue your relationship with her. And instead of even like sending her an email or something to say like, hey I think we should break up, you just didn't do that and went off and knocked a girl up, so he comes in last place. Sorry, Jacob. Blame the writers. <laughs> At number 18 and second from the bottom, we have Prothe the Prothean Javik. I know Javik is super popular with so many people and I'm not saying I don't like him because I do, but he's just such an asshole and I know he's supposed to be like he's intentionally written that way it's not that he just comes across badly it's that he is intentionally meant to be an asshole because he's like 50,000 years old and he thinks that everybody he's basically just got this real uh kind of race supremacy thing going on but not quite in the way that we would understand it like in our lives just because his race that he comes from is 50,000 years older than the people that are here or are at least 50,000 years more advanced and everybody he's kicking about with now that considers themselves to be like the supreme races are all in his time were like primitive as he keeps pointing out so essentially it's like the way that humans consider themselves to be superior to monkeys you know what i mean like we evolved from the monkeys but we're not letting the monkeys rule the world because they're not as advanced as us that's sort of how Prothe the Prothean sees like every other race in the galaxy which means that he just spends the whole time telling them what they're doing wrong and how back in his cycle things didn't work like this and back in my cycle you used to crawl on the ground and you had no legs like and I do like him I like every time he talks about chucking something out the airlock because that's always fun but in general he's just so unpleasant to be around and I like bringing him along in missions to get his like 
Prothean lore input but in general I'm just like I, quite a lot of times I forgot to go and talk to him in, in between missions like I'd go down to engineering and just forget he was there and it's just because like in general I was just so uninterested in what he had to say because he was just always been an asshole and I was just like shut up and then he starts yelling at Liara and I'm like just shut up and he does sort of grow and he is slightly less of a dick by the end of the game and that's nice and it's nice to see character development but I I don't know uh, I don't think I'm ever going to be besties with Javik. He's always going to get on my nerves. <laughs> Number 17 on our list, and I feel bad about this one, and it's not really fair. It's not really a fair assessment, but there was nowhere else that I could put her. Um, it's Ashley Williams. <laughs> So, as you might be able to expect, um, Ash was not my Vermeer survivor. So she's the only character who I didn't get to see her full story from beginning to end. Because everybody else, I made sure I kept them alive. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I used to walk through to make sure I got everyone out of the suicide mission. Um, I know that's bad, but it's just because this was the first time I'd ever experienced the series, I wanted to be able to get everything I could. I wanted to be able to see the characters do everything possible, so I made sure I got them all to the end. Um, it meant that everybody else made it to the end of their story intact, apart from Ashley. So Ashley is at a massive disadvantage because she's the only character who I never got to see develop past the first game. I feel bad putting her that low because she might improve by Mass Effect 3 and I've heard people say that she does and she's less of a space racist and stuff by the third one but I can't really rank her above characters that I know better and that I like better because that would just be unfair but I do feel bad for her um so take that one with a pinch of salt because my opinion on Ashley might change if I ever play a version where I keep her alive. I don't dislike Ashley at least not really but I think she is definitely the least interesting of all the squad mates in the first game I certainly brought her on the least amount of missions. I hardly ever brought Ashley and maybe that didn't help my opinion of her but she just never really seemed particularly useful. Like she was purely combat and so was I because I'm a so I was playing Soldier Shepherd so I never really had any use for her. It was better to bring someone like Garrus or Rex or Tally or Caden or Leia or literally any of the others. Someone with biotic or tech skills. So I never brought her but I did like talking to her in the cargo bay and I think she always has some interesting things to say and I really liked getting to hear about her family and I felt like such an asshole when I let her die because I was completely aware that she had like three sisters and she was the oldest and she tried to look after them and stuff and her dad was dead so she was like sort of like kind of playing the role of a parent to her siblings and they always like look to her for advice and stuff. So I felt terrible because I knew that I was taking her away from her family but by that point I was like there was no way I could give up Caden it just wasn't happening so um she has a bit of a space racist at the beginning which does rub me the wrong way because I uh love my alien brethren but she's not the worst and she does have some nice like banter with like Caden and Shepherds when they're all in the Citadel together and I did feel bad about letting her die but she just doesn't really hold a candle to any of the other characters so she I don't actively dislike her the way that I dislike Jacob and the way that Javit gets on my nerves but I also don't actively like her enough to put her any higher on the list so she's taken the third last spot but at least she's not dead last you know she she got that far sorry Ash at number 16 it is Zaid Masani <laughs> Um, so the best thing about Zaid is the fact that he's voiced by Robin Sachs, who played Ethan Rain in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Robin Sachs was genuinely such a great guy. He was so fun and lovely and really nice to fans and he was just awesome and it's really cool that the last thing he ever recorded in his acting career was the Citadel DLC because what a hilarious way to go out as your final role but it's heartbreaking that we lost him right after that because you know he was he was a great actor and I remember when he died and I was really sad about it I was really upset because he was great he he was such a great guy um but I still don't really love Zaid that much I think he's a lot better in three like he grew on me a lot during the Citadel DLC but back in two he actually just 
I couldn't really be arsed with him at all. Like, I mean, for a start, he kind of just has that stereotypical, like, cockney geezer with a gun vibe. Like, he thinks he's a Cray twin or something. And I get very bored of that very fast. Like, cockney geezers is just such a, a like, it's just a really easy trope, you know? It's a really easy stereotype to manipulate and it's like, it only can go so far and maybe that's because I live in Britain, you know? So like, I, I don't need the, like, the Mitchell twins and everything that I want <laughs> them, you know? Like, I don't, I don't need a cockney geezer and everything. There's plenty of cockney geezers where I live and on my TV and the news and everything. Like, I don't need more of them in my video games. And it depends, because you get great ones like Charlie Cutter, but Zaid just wasn't cutting it for me. Um, also the fact that on his loyalty mission, he can get really mad at you for not blowing up a factory full of people. And I'm like, Zaid, can you not be a dish canoe right now, maybe? Also, he doesn't really have fun dialogue. Like, you can't have proper co conversations with him or Kazumi in the Normandy. Because Zumi has great dialogue. I love her dialogue on the Normandy because she's just gossiping about the rest of the ship. But Saeed, you just go down into the, the engineering deck and he's just standing there and he's like, did I ever tell you about the time that I cut a Krogan's head off? And I'm like, I don't actually want to know. And he's like, or this other time that like I shot a guy in the face. And I'm like, again, I, I don't really want to know. <laughs> so he really didn't, I didn't gel with him at all and I barely took him on any missions in Mass Effect 2 because I just wasn't. I wasn't interested. Um, but he grew up in Mass Effect 3 when he's like fighting with the the um, the claw machine in the Citadel DLC and that whole bit when him and Garrus are like rigging booby traps in Shepard's apartment. He's funny. He's definitely funny. And there's a bit where he's like talking to Samara and they're like, I don't understand art. <laughs> so he's a fun, he's fun in the Citadel DLC. But outside of that, I don't really like him. And I feel like I can't judge someone purely off the back of their Citadel DLC content, considering everyone in that is just off their heads. So I'm sorry, Zaid, but you're you're getting that. That's where you're going. At number 15, and I feel bad about this one too, because she's great, but it's Samara. <laughs> Samara's just, she's great in that she's a badass and it's really cool because we get to find all about like Asari um, a Sari Justicars, which I think is really interesting. There's some really great lore there and obviously about her daughters who are all Ardot Yakshi. She's got a great storyline, but as a character, she's just not the most engaging. And it's probably just because that is her personality is that she's very reserved. She's very kind of, um, closed off from the world, very matter of fact. There's not really any kind of humour or anything with her and it doesn't have to be, but there's also not a lot of emotion either. She's just very direct, very plain, very matter of fact. I don't know, I just don't think she's quite as exciting or quite as interesting as the others. She doesn't really have any kind of interesting dialogue or she doesn't really have a particularly strong bond with anyone in the group either. Like, she doesn't have the friendships that some of the others have. She just always felt like a bit of an outsider in the group. She's nice. It's nice to see her in the Citadel DLC. But, I mean, even the bit where you invite her up to the flat, like, um, it ends up with her and Shepard just sitting on the couch and Samara's like, let's just sit here even if there's nothing to say. And I feel like, in a weird way, that kind of summed up her entire character as that you just can't really have a conversation with Samara because she doesn't say anything. I like her because she's a badass and she's a just a car and she's got a cool story and she is nice and she doesn't, I don't dislike her in any way. She doesn't rub me the wrong way like some of the ones that are below her do. But also I don't feel particularly drawn to her either. She's just kind of, I'm sort of indifferent to Samara, I think. It's like the four at the bottom of my list are slightly in the dislike bin um, and then Samara's sort of indifferent and now everybody from this point on are people that I like to varying degrees. <laughs> Samara just kind of sits in a no man's land of I don't really know what to do with you. <laughs> Number 14 is <laughs> Jimmy Vega. <laughs> James is, I mean, <sighs> There are people who like James and there are people who just don't. 
and I don't know. I like him and I don't. It depends. He is just your classic beefcake man. You know, like, he's a bit of a flirt, bit of a player. He gives everyone dumb nicknames. You know, he names the Spanish guy Esteban because <laughs> why not? And he calls Shepard Lola and he sleeps with Ashley at the party if you bring her along. And, you know, he's just like a total... He's just a total lad. He's Chad. He might as well be called Chad Vega. He's Chad Hogan. But I like him because he, he, he is funny. He does have some really good lines and he, he is nice. He does care. Um, I really like the banter that he has with Cortez down in the engineering bay. They've always got some great laughs and if Cortez gets killed later on, um, like James like shouts out like you're gonna pay for that. Like he's really angry because Cortez and him were like BFFs. And I like that. I like all of that. But at the same time, he's just too much of a stereotypical beefcake. But I find him funny. I can't help it. I do find him funny. He's um, And I like the fact that he has that kind of bond where he sees Shepard as sort of like his Anderson, whereas Shepard like convinces him to join the N7 program and stuff. So he's a cool guy and I do like him. I just i am also like, shut up, Vega. <laughs> yeah. But it took me until pretty much the end of the game before I discovered that he's voiced by Preddy Prince. So good for him. Good for him because I did not recognise him. That's some good acting there. Number 13 is our one and only Geth squad mate, Legion. Legion, I think the only reason he's not higher is just because you don't get a huge amount of time to get to know him. Um, if you want the best chance of completing Mass Effect 2 properly and keeping everyone alive, then you need to really get Legion right before the suicide mission so you don't get to bring him on any of the other missions, um, which is a shame, but you know. So I didn't get to spend a lot of time with him in Mass Effect 2. And then you get him for a little while in Mass Effect 3 when you go to Ranok. I really like him. I love I love the whole idea of of Legion and the way that he changes everyone's perception of the Geth and that moment when he turns to Tally, like when she says, like, the answer to your question is yes, and he turns around and he says, I know Tally, but thank you for saying it. And I was like, I actually like properly made me like <gasps> Cause it's like, first of all, he just said I and he he thanked her and oh uh, does this unit have a soul <laughs> legion is heartbreaking because you, there's not really any good way you can't really save him i don't think there is a way to get legion to to be saved um and the fact that he manages to change tally's whole opinion on the geth like and she's like i'm mourning a geth like how does that make sense it's just so great he's great and and everything that happens on Ranok and his story is so, so wonderful. I love him. <laughs> Number 12. Now, originally this character was actually a lot lower on my list because I was really angry with them through all of Mass Effect 2. And then Mass Effect 3 came around and it, it made me cry for him. So, so that, I wasn't expecting Mass Effect 3 to take his story the way it did and it ruined me. And it's... Our good old Solarian doctor, Morden Solis. Morden is obviously hilarious in the way that he speaks. The fact that he talks really fast, he misses entire words out of his sentences, and then when he says too many things at once, he does that giant sniff. He's great and he's funny and I love listening to him talk because he is so funny but the reason that me and him were not getting along in Mass Effect 2 is because he was determined to defend the genophage. Now I am a you know <laughs> complete total Krogan sympathizer. I know that they were bad, they were not you know they did the Krogan rebellions and they did bad shit but I am completely against the genophage. I think it's barbaric and I defend the Krogan to my death. I was getting so pissed off every time Morden was like, oh, but we had to do it because otherwise they would have risen up and they would have attacked. And it's like, that's not how that works. You can't just wipe out a race 
because they might rise up and fight you like that that essentially what they did this whole thing of they had to like stop everyone from having babies is sort of kind of like that story from the bible where the pharaoh throws all the hebrew babies into the river because he's afraid of a hebrew uprising he doesn't want there to be so many hebrews that they could try and overthrow the kingdom of egypt so they have all the Hebrew babies killed, so there's less Hebrews. And it's basically the exact same thing with the Krogan, is that the Turians and the Salarians created this thing that prevents them from being able to have children in an attempt to try and reduce their numbers to stop them from rising up and overthrowing them. Now, I get why, because the Krogan are really dangerous in a way that the Hebrew people weren't, but it's still not okay, and I'm really against it. And every time that Morden tried to defend it and say, but it was the right thing to do at the time, and we had to do it, and I know it's not the best thing, you know, idea in the world, but it was what we had to do. I was like, can you shut your Salarian face? Like, shut the fuck up. So like for all of Mass Effect 2, he was like one of my least favourite characters because I was just so mad at him over the Genophage thing. But then Mass Effect 3 came around and I was unprepared for any of it. So first of all, he's super nice and he really supports Bakara and you find him singing in his office and I was not prepared for more than singing like every time he sung in that bit in the Citadel DLC where you find the data pad on the floor where he's singing songs like he's so cute <laughs> he's so sweet and he keeps like he's got so many hilarious lines like Morden absolutely has some of the funniest lines in the series like when he's trying to help Joker figure out how he can have sex with Edie he's brilliant he's so funny and so he doesn't realize he's being funny is what's great is he just says these things thinks they're totally acceptable it's like morden what are you saying stop it he's so hilarious but when we went to tachanka and he so it can go different ways but basically if you're doing the paragon way and everyone's alive which they were um because no way in hell was I shooting Rex on Vermeer get to fuck um then Morden decides that he's going to go up the tower and release the genophage cure and sacrifice his own life in the process and I was completely unprepared and when he stand, he comes to Shepherd and he's like it had to be me someone else might have gotten it wrong and I was just like and then you hear that sometimes when Shepard's in like the whisper dream thing and I was just like oh my god and then he goes up to the top and he says like it's a new start for all of us and then he gets blown up and it's like he knew that he wasn't coming back down from that tower but he's like he said you know it had to be me someone else might have gotten it wrong because the way he sees it like he was the one who helped start the genophage so he has to be the one that cures it he has to be the one that ends the suffering that he did to the Krogan and even though I still think he, he still thinks that the genophage is the right thing to do, he also accepts that it was barbaric and that now it needs to be put right. And he gave up his life to set it right and to make sure that the Krogan would go on and live. And it means that, like, from now on, like, every Krogan that has a baby has more than Solus to thank for that. So even though he took away so much from them, he also was the one that gave it all back. So my heart absolutely shattered. He's great, he's a hero, he died and he did the right thing and I forgive him for everything that I was mad at him about in Mass Effect 2. Morden, we're back, we're, we're, we're cool, we're cool, you know, we're no beef anymore, just, just love. But speaking of people who die and that can't be saved, number 11 on my list is Thane Creolus. is just wonderful i don't think it's possible to dislike thane like there's he's just a paragon of wonder like he was an assassin he did bad things but he was also a hero and he was just such a good person with such a good heart and the whole thing with him and his son Colliat was just the best and it was so nice to see a drell because we don't really get to see very much of the drell through the entire series and having someone like him who was terminally ill but still putting his like I know obviously if you're terminally ill maybe it's less like powerful to put your life in the line because it's like well I'm gonna die anyway so I might as well do it this way but I still think the fact that he was so ill and it was clearly a struggle for him to try and and try to try and help shepherds he could have been like look 
I'm dying. I feel like shit. I'm gonna go and live on the beach and wait to die. Like, I'm not coming along helping you fight the collectors. I've got, you know, dying to do. But he didn't. He still chose to come and fight alongside Shepard. And then, of course, in 3, when the Citadel is attacked during the coup, he, like, still tries to fight to save Shepard and the Salarian Counselor. He fights Kai Leng when he's so ill. He's like, he says himself, he doesn't think he has very much longer to go. Like, he's so ill, he's death's door. And he still tries to put up a fight to try and protect Shepard and the Salarian Counselor. He is such a hero and he has great dialogue and he's super nice and he's a great father and Thane is just the best and I miss him. And it's it's nice because Shepard always takes Thane's death really hard and I'm like, yeah, you should because he's great. And I actually, like, so many times I was walking along the deck and nobody ever, like, in the third game, no one ever goes into the life support bay. There's no reason for that door to even be open every time you go in there's just a mug sitting on the table and I'm like that's where Thane was that's where Thane used to sit and he's not here anymore and then he died and I'm like that's where Thane used to sit and he's dead and then you get to have the memorial service for him in the Citadel DLC and it's like the Citadel DLC is so fun it's all about like humor and having a laugh with your mates and then right in the middle there's this bit where you have to have a memorial service for Thane and his son is there and everyone's telling stories and it's just heartbreaking and apparently if you romance Thane, like, his ghost appears to Shepard and I haven't seen that scene but I just know it will destroy me if I watch it. I loved Thane and he was a hero and I miss him. At number 10, and you're all going to hate me for this one, I know, and I, I, I know it seems bad but just hear me out, okay? Hear me out. She still made it into the top 10, okay? She made it into the top 10. But 10th on my list is... Dr. Liara Tissoni. <laughs> Liara is what seems to be the creator's favourite character in that she is the only squad mate who will make it to the end of the game, or the end of Mass Effect 3, almost at least, intact. What I mean by that is that it is impossible to kill Liara until literally like the final the final bit of Mass Effect 3 when Harbinger's beam may take out your squad mates but only if you play the game really badly. If you play the game well it won't take out your squad mates but if you play it badly it will. Other than that Liara can't die. She can't die in 1, she can't die in 2, she can't die in 3 until that moment. She just can't die. So it's like, it, and she's also the only character you can romance in all three games, which means she's the only character that you can get the Panamore trophy for without dumping or cheating on one of your your previous partners. And I just feel like there's something in that. She's also the only character that you get to hear from in Andromeda. She's also the character that appears in the Mass Effect 5 trailer. And you just get the feeling that the writers might be a little bit obsessed with Liara. Like, maybe they're just a little bit too in, into Liara and that she's maybe not quite as exciting as they think she is. Now, I'm not saying that's like, obviously I'm not judging her character on how much the creators seem to treat her like a creator's pet. But in reality, I don't think Liara is as exciting as the creators think she is. I like Liara. Of course I like Liara. She's a sweetheart. She's kind. She's caring. She always looks out for everyone. She's always trying to help her friends and, you know, she's always there to support everyone. She's there to support Shepherds and anyone else that needs it. She's like the team mom, you know, she's always trying to take care of everyone. And on top of that, she's an absolute badass. She's the shadow broker, you know, she is a badass queen who has got all these people in the universe thinking that she's the same shadow broker they've been reporting to the whole time when actually, you know, she's Liara to Sony and she's on the Normandy with Commander Shepard and none of them know. So she's obviously awesome and Lair of the Shadow Broker is a fantastic DLC but the thing is is I just don't think she's quite as interesting as all the others. She's very soft-spoken, she's quite matter-of-fact as well. She doesn't really have the same kind of like humour or anything that the others have and I just think that in general like I just don't really engage with Liara as much as the others. I don't bring her on a lot of missions she doesn't seem to, even in 3, she doesn't seem to have a lot of dialogue when you go into her room. Like, you know, you go in to talk to like Garrus or Tally and 
there's a lot of scenes where like there's stuff happening like or you go into the the port observation deck and they're hanging out in the bar or playing poker or the bit where Javik and James are like or is it no it's got oh no there is a bit with Javik there's a few bits in the kitchen where like James is arguing with other crewmates Liara just seems to spend a lot of time in her room and even if you go in to talk to her she generally only seems to make a comment on whatever the last mission was and then be like I'm too busy and I'm sure you get a lot more dialogue with her if you romance her and I almost did I almost did romance her in the first game I actually told her I had feelings for her and then backed out <laughs> um but I think I actually liked her more in the first game than I have done in any of the games since because in the first game she was like kind of awkward and quirky and she didn't really know how to deal with the fact that she had feelings for Shepard and every time she said something she was like oh no I think I've said something wrong like just ignore me I'm an idiot like don't even do not perceive me I don't exist I'm just gonna sit here and do my, my computer stuff ignore me whereas in the next two games she's much more confident and actually getting lost a lot of the charm for me so as much as I do love Liara because of course I do because she's Liara she's just not in my opinion as exciting or interesting as a lot of the other characters especially the ones that are as prominent as she is but quickly we'll go on to number nine on the list we're getting there we're into the top 10. uh so number nine on the list is uh subject zero herself the queen of the biotics jack <laughs> Jack is insane but also so great like Jack was so fun in Mass Effect 2 I loved bringing her in missions like she comes out with some absolute crackers sometimes she's just so so bonkers but like so awesome and feisty and her style like all her tattoos and everything she looks so cool and I love the fact that she's like she's you know and two she's bald and she's super badass and she's quite masculine in a lot of ways but she's also really feminine like she's got this real feminine quality to her where it's like you would never look at her and confuse her for a man she's obviously a woman but she just has a lot of masculine traits but she's still very much feminine and I really like that about her I really like that she has that sort of dichotomy where she she's she's not she's both you know she can be super masculine she can also be very feminine and obviously she comes along in, in uh, 3 with that cool ponytail and some eye makeup on and she just looks absolutely amazing. She looks so good in 3, <laughs> even if Miranda says that her haircut is stupid. And I'll admit I preferred her bald, but she looks awesome. And just everything about her, her story is great. The whole thing about, you know, the way she was raised in the horrible Cerberus place and then she goes on and she starts raising the kids at the Grissom Academy and becomes their teacher and everyone seems to just love her. She's awesome. Jack is so cool and I love the dialogue you get with her and I love bringing her in missions because she's always got some hilarious and badass things to say and I just think she's great. I just think she's absolutely wonderful and I feel like she could have probably kicked a reaper in the face and it would have shattered on impact like you know. If Jack had been sent out there to destroy the Reapers, I feel like she could have done it on her own. She, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Why did we not try just sending Jack out to kick the Reapers in the face? Like, R.I.P. to your Commander Shepard, but I'm different. Number eight is the first of my two Krogan boys, and it's Grunt. <laughs> Gron is just such a sweetheart. It's like raising a child who is like fully grown but is also a baby. Because it's what it's like. It's like he can walk and he can talk and he can fire a gun but he's still baby. <laughs> and everything about him in the Citadel DLC, his whole story about how his friends broke. <laughs> it's that bit when he falls past the window. <laughs> I was in fact. It's like they broke me out and then they just see him plummeting past the met the hospital window like ah <laughs> and then they climb up in the Krogan statue and then he sets fire to a police car <laughs> and then I obviously had my shepherd cover for him so he was on a special N7 mission because like I'm not gonna let my poor boy grunt get into trouble for just wanting to have some fun I love him he's the sweetest and when you get off onto Chanka to like help him and his Krogan squad and as soon as he sees Shepard and he's like Shepard and he comes running over to her 
he's so sweet he's like he's like he thinks shepherds his mom or something <laughs> and then he's, he says to her in the citadel dlc he's like thanks for bringing me out of that or is it is it the citadel dlc or is it, no i think it's it's um when you say goodbye to your your squad mates at the end uh, on earth at the end of three and he's like shepherd thanks for getting me out of that tank and i'm like you're welcome you're so welcome grun you deserved it you're an angel he's so funny and so cute and every time he's like hey, hey, hey. <laughs> and when he's being the bouncer at this at the citadel party <laughs> it's so funny he's just such a sweetheart i loved bringing grunt on missions he made up for the fact that i didn't have rex like i still prefer rex obviously you haven't he hasn't been on this list yet so he's higher up but like he was a good stand-in for rex i love a krogan i love the krogan Number seven in the list is uh, probably maybe not everyone's favourite. I don't know how popular she is, but for me, she's a queen and it's uh, Kasumi Goto. I love Kasumi. I took her on so many missions in Turks. I just think she's hilarious. Like everything in that Stolen Memories mission is hysterical. Like, it's, it's a shame, obviously, because, like, you know, her friend and he died and everything. But she's so funny. And then she shows up in the three and continues to just be hilarious. And, you know, that bit where, like, she, she helps out with the Hanar diplomat thing and she just, like, randomly appears in the corner and is like, hey, Shepard. And then in the Citadel DLC, she's, like, rummaging in your cupboard and looking at your panties and trying to, like, pull off a heist in the casino. But, like, I just think she's so funny. And like I said earlier, I love when I used to go into, like, the observation deck and she was just sitting. She would just gossip about the rest of the crew. Like, everybody else gave you, like, thoughts on the mission and she would just be sitting there talking about the other people in the crew and, like, bitching about them or saying what she liked about them. I was like, you're such a little gossip. And I would happily sit here all day and join you. She's so cool. She's got a great design. I love her voice. She's a total badass. And her mission, the Stolen Memories mission, is one of my favourites in Mass Effect 2. Like, that is one of the best loyalty missions because it's just so fun getting to go into this big cool apartment and sneak about and hack stuff. She's awesome. I love Kasumi and I feel like she doesn't get nearly enough appreciation. The Citadel DLC, I feel like, like she deserved more because at the party, like, the kind of running joke is that she randomly appears in rooms because she can go invisible but it means you don't really get to see her hanging out with the other members of the crew which I think is a shame because I think I would have liked to get to see her have a bit more interaction with the others but she's still great and I love her uh yeah Kasumi forever love that girl number six on the list and we're getting into my proper favorites now like we're into the top six now the top five are my top five but you know I think with who we've got left I can say that pretty much all of them are my my top favorites. Uh, number six is Tali, Zora, Naraya, Vaznima, Vaz Normandy. <music> love that girl. I don't think it's possible to not love Tali. Back in the first game, I was like, she's cute, but you know, she's like a bit, you know, she's a kid, she's on her pilgrimage. And I kind of was like, I brought her on a lot of missions because she had the hacking skill. And that's one of the annoying things about Mass Effect 1 is that if you bring someone who's not got a high enough hacking skill, you just can't open the chests and get the guns and stuff. I'm glad that they did away with that in the later games because that was really irritating. Not that I didn't like bringing Tally places, but it meant I never really got the option to bring anyone else because I had to basically bring Garrus and Tally everywhere if I wanted to be able to hack stuff. What I'm saying is, in Mass Effect 1, I felt like I was kind of forced to like Tally because she was always there. Whereas Mass Effect 2 and 3, she's just great. She's so cool and she really grows a lot. And the moment that I saw her at the start of Mass Effect 2, I was like, oh my god, it's Tally. And I was just so excited to see her. And she just immediately recognised Shepard and she immediately trusts her. She never once thinks, like, maybe Shepard's doing the wrong thing because she just trusts her implicitly. And I love that. Like, Tally is just undying loyalty. And even when Shepard does things, like, to do with the Geth, where tally it's not really what tally thinks is right she never questions it you know she is just completely devoted to shepherd and believes that shepherd will always do what's best and would never let her down and you know that bit at the end of three when she's like i backed you when i was just a kid in my pilgrimage i backed you when the normandy was a cerberus ship what kind of friend would i be if i didn't back you now and i was just like 
I love her. I love her. I love her relationship she gets with Garrus as well in the third game because I don't romance either of them. So they got together, which is super cute. And she's like, I'm only using you for your body, Vakarian. <laughs> I love her. And I love her voice and I love her suit. And when she stands up to the Admiralty on, on her and the, what do you call it? The migrant fleet, the flotilla. She's just awesome. I love Tally. She's a sweetheart. She's badass. She always wants to do what's right. She is loyal to a fault. And even though she gets it wrong about the Geth, in the end, she realizes that she was wrong. And she realizes that Legion was a person and she mourns him and she tells him that he has a soul. And it's such a powerful moment. And she finally gets her home world back. And I love Tally so much. She's so wonderful. Into the top five now, and number five on my list is someone who I just would die for. And did. <laughs> Actually did. And it's the Enhanced Defense Intelligence, known as Edie. I fucking love Edie. Edie is so good. And let me tell you, right? Let me tell you. I was vaguely aware of what the endings were. I well, I was vaguely aware insofar as one of them was destroy the Reapers, one of them was control the Reapers, and one of them was synthesis, which I didn't know what that meant. And also refusal. Like, I knew, I'd seen those words thrown around, so I understood. I was like, so, we destroy them, they blow up. We control them, it's like what the elusive man said. I didn't know what synthesis was, and if we refuse, then we don't do anything and the world ends. So I was like, okay, obviously I'm going to go for destroy because like I've been playing this whole series with the purpose being that I'm going to destroy the Reapers. I'm obviously not going to turn around now and not destroy them. That's dumb. Like, don't be silly. And then I got to the end and I spoke to the Catalyst and the Catalyst was like, it doesn't discriminate. If you choose to destroy the Reapers, it will destroy all synthetic life in the galaxy. And my very first thought was, oh my god, no, because that will blow up Edie. And I was like, no, I was like, I'm sorry, like that would be sad for the Geth. And I'd be sad to lose the Geth after I managed to broker a peace and keep them alive. But I was like, no, I can't choose, I can't choose destroy if it kills Edie. And he's like, but I also knew that destroy was the only ending where Shepard lives. So that was another reason. I was like, oh, well, obviously I want to destroy because I want Shepard to live. But when they said that, I was like, okay, so my choice now, I'm obviously not going to go control because control means agreeing with the elusive man and that's not happening. I'm obviously not going to go refusal because that's just, no, that's dumb. So my choice is now either destroy ED and live or keep ED alive and die. And so I picked this and see this ending purely because I refused to kill ED. And it was because she is one of my top favourite characters and I just love her so much that I would rather have Shepard die than Edie. <laughs> so I took out Shepard and I synthesized the whole world basically so that I would keep Edie alive. And at the end she gets that great monologue where she says about how she's alive and she hugs your love interest and she says like I've got a life now because of Commander Shepard and she finally can be a person because she is like everyone else now because everyone is slightly synthetic. And she's synthetic and now she fits in and she's a person like everyone else. And I was like, this is the best ending. But I love her. I love how funny she is. I love every time she tries to tell a joke and she's like, that was a joke. I love to see humans on their knees. Her whole relationship with Joker. I bring her on missions all the time because I just think she's awesome as a squad mate. She's got great dialogue. She is absolutely fantastic. I just love Edie so much. And I'm like... The idea that the, night, the next Mass Effect might carry on from the Destroy ending is breaking me apart. I'm like, they must. I've got this whole headcanon in my head now where I'm like, maybe because she's a synthetic life form, but, 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 she's also a computer program and everything else in the Normandy works. It's not as if like their sensors, their galaxy map and everything stopped working. So it takes out synthetic life. But it doesn't erase computer programs. So if Edie's a program, then maybe her drives and her drive core and everything are still in the um, the Normandy, and maybe they can reboot her and turn her back on. So I'm gonna go with the opinion that we're gonna get to turn Edie back on. Um, if it does carry on from the destroy ending, we will turn Edie back on, and her and Joker will get married and go off and live in the sunset somewhere at the end of the game. Because I refuse to accept that her and Joker do not get a happy ending because they are the cutest. I love them. Best relationship. OTP.
love them. I love Joker as well. Like I, he's not obviously not in this list because he's not a squad mate, but like Joker is one of the best characters in this series. I would die for Joker. And I, again, kind of did because it was like, I need Easy to live and I need her to be with Joker. So I sort of threw Shepard into the, the conduit thing. Uh, just so that her, Edie and Joker could be together. <laughs> but coming in at number four is our last female character on the list and if you haven't worked it out yet, it is the one that for some reason people don't like as much as I do and it is my girl, my queen, my hero, Miranda Lawson. <laughs> Apparently not, like, I saw someone online today, right, and I was watching clips of when Shepard remembers the fallen squad mates, right, in the bathroom with Liara, like, just, just that, um, and someone put in the comments, like, I'm thinking about Miranda, why? I'm like, shut the fuck up, but it turns out not everyone loves Miranda, I thought she would be, like, one of the most popular characters, but no, it turns out not everyone loves Miranda the way I do. I loved Miranda. Pretty much my only criticism about Mass Effect 3 was the fact that she wasn't in it more. Like, I wanted her in my squad. And I guess she was kind of doing the whole hero of another story thing off trying to save Ariana. But, like, I wanted her in my squad. And I keep saying, I'm like, if the next Mass Effect comes around and it takes place after Mass Effect 3, give me Miranda as a squad member. Give her back. <laughs> because in the main game, outside of the Citadel DLC, you only see her couple of times on the Citadel, very very briefly at the end of the Horizon mission, you don't even get to fight with her, like fight alongside her or anything, and then you can say goodbye to her at the end. Like where the fuck is my Miranda content? I love that girl. But I do love in the Citadel's DLC where you can like run around to the apartment for a drink, go out to the casino, try and do girl talk with her, have that whole bit where she talks to Jack and Jack calls her great tit and says she has nice tits. Miranda nice tits Lawson's as I call her. And now I get it. Miranda at the start was a bitch. 100%. She was a cow. I really didn't like her at the start. I was like, why do people talk about this girl? Is it really just because she's got a nice arse? Um, and I was like, God, she's so annoying. But very, very quickly, she grew on me. And I took her on so many missions in Mass Effect 2. I loved her. And I was like determined. I would have Shepard in her office like every time a mission ended. Because I was like, if I just keep talking to her, it'll be like Sable in Animal Crossing. You know, like eventually she'll be my best friend and she'll give me patterns. So I just had Shepard in there like every time a mission ended like Miranda I want to talk and she's like no not now Shepard and I'm like okay go out come back in how about now you want to talk you want to talk you want to be friends you want to like have a glass of wine together do you want to like talk about our feelings talk about boys she's a caring big sister and she's got all these like insecurities about the fact that she was built instead of being born but she's still a good friend and a good person and she you know betrays she quits Cerberus and I had her on that mission when you speak to the elusive man in the collector base and she says like consider this my resignation and I was just like fuck yeah girl you tell him you tell him and then she shows up in the next one she's like yeah I've got assassins after me turns out the elusive man doesn't like it if you quit <laughs> and then she goes to the sanctuary and she tries to like leave messages to make sure everyone knows that it's evil and she was sending intel to the alliance the whole time to make sure that they would win the war and be able to stop the reapers and stop the elusive man and i'm like she completely did a 180 and she turned to the good side so even though she was fighting the wrong side once she was always good at heart and she knew what to do and she did the right thing when it came down to the wire so yeah i fucking love miranda but coming now into my top three and i mean you'll be able to figure out who's left so number three which might be a surprise is caden alenko lieutenant Major, Spectre, and my Shepherd's one and only true love. I romanced Caden way back in the first game. I had originally told Liara that I liked her, and then realized that I still liked Caden and I didn't know who to pick. And then I had that whole bit where they confront me and the the like the comms room being like pick and I must have sat there for like a good five minutes with the option of like who to pick on the screen and I just couldn't decide and eventually I picked Caden 
And I was so glad because I just fell so in love with Caden throughout the series and like the moment when they met up on Horizon in the second one I was like howling because I was just so upset when he like stormed off and he didn't want to be with her anymore but then he sent that email, the About Horizon email and when I listened to um, Raphael read that out I was, in, I was in bits, I was in complete mess. It's like, you know, do you remember that night on Ilos? That night meant everything to me and I was just like... <laughs> I think Caden's such a sweetheart, right? He is hilariously funny in such a kind of droll, understated way. But he's also so sweet and so nice and such a good friend. And he's always trying to support everyone else in the ship. And he's always trying to support Shepard. And even though he's not always right in the way that he thinks, like he's got it wrong a couple of times. Like he got it wrong about Shepard when she worked with Cerberus. But he always just wants to do the right thing. That's how he became a Spectre. And I'm like, I can't ever imagine Ashley Williams being a Spectre. Like, I can't believe that one, right? I don't care how many times they try and tell us that she became a spectre. I I absolutely don't believe it in the slightest. But Caden, Caden I can believe. Because Caden is just so determined in his convictions. And he always wants to do what's right. And even if it means pointing a gun at the woman that you love, he'll still do it because he's trying to do what's right. And I'm like, you know what? It takes insane courage to stand up to the woman that you love. You know, when you're just trying to, to to make sure that the right thing happens and that the world keeps spinning you know but it also takes a lot of courage to turn around and shoot counselor odina when when you know he's you think that he's a good guy but it takes a lot of courage to to do that and be sure that that's the right thing to do and that's what i mean like i just love the fact that caden always has the courage to do what's right even if it's hard even if it seems like the wrong thing at the time if you know it's the right thing to do he'll do it and his romance with shepherd is just absolutely wonderful i loved every second of that story like their story is so beautiful and like i've seen a lot of garris's romance because i love garris you'll notice he hasn't appeared yet so who's gonna get number one hammer rex place your bets now um, but I just think Cadence is, is, is just such a beautiful story, like, you know, and she's like, you know, when we get through this, I'm gonna be waiting for you. You better show up. You know, you're gonna find a way to win this war. I know you will. And when you do, I'll be waiting for you. Or, or, is the woman that I went to hell and back for, the person that I loved, are you still in there somewhere? And she's like, they didn't change me, Caden, or the way I feel about you. And then later on, she's like, I don't want to uh, hide what I feel for you, Caden. <laughs> but I love Caden. I love, like, his banter, the things he comes out with on missions. Everything that he says in the Citadel DLC is fucking hilarious. Bringing him to the casino is a riot. Um, his dancing is terrible. <laughs> his excuses to try and distract the guard are priceless. Um, like he's so caring and so loving and he is not afraid to show his emotions like he gets so upset when Shepard's like you know when you leave when Shepard and him are, are you know, at the end of the game on earth and he's saying goodbye to her and he's like I can't lose you again he's just so beautiful and so open with his feelings and he's such a nice guy and he's you know even if you were romancing Liara he still stands by her and even if someone else in the ship does something bad to him he always supports everyone and he just is such a good friend <laughs> and such a good guy and he's so hot <laughs> like I'm sorry but Caden's hot and his voice is hot and I love him he mm. Like, I gave up a Paramore trophy because I didn't cheat on him in Mass Effect 2 because I was determined we were getting him back in Mass Effect 3. So I go, went through that whole game with no romance, none at all, to make sure that I kept my relationship with Caden intact. 100%. My big, bisexual, biotic babe. That's who he is. Okay, number two. We're really into it now. Number two in the list, we're almost there, is my big... Krogan Daddy Rex. I fucking love Rex. I loved him from the minute we met him back in the Citadel in the first game. I just think he is hilarious. He's awesome. He's badass. He's he's a Krogan and I love Krogan and he's the great thing about Rex is not only is he like a big 
ballsy idiot with a gun. He's also really diplomatic, really caring. He is the leader of his clan and he is determined to do whatever it takes to make sure that they are safe and that they cure the genophage and that they can continue. Like he wants what's best for the Krogan and he will do whatever it takes to keep his clan, clan or not, safe. And, and, and he's so good at it. Like his brother Reeve is exactly what you don't want in charge of the clan because he's an idiot and an asshole. Whereas Rex is like such a good hearted guy and he loves Shepard and you know he really he really does like he really stands by Shepard and he's like there's a bit if you bring him on a, a mission in the Citadel DLC where he's like if you mess with Shepard you mess with me and he like lands on that ship that Kodiak thing and like knocks it into next week he just like kills a bunch of guys with his shoulder at the beginning of the Citadel DLC because he's such a badass but he's so funny he has so many great lines he's a great leader he's a great friend I just love him. I just think Rex is wonderful and I brought him on most of the missions in the first game because I thought he was great. Like, I I brought him on, yeah, most, like, all the main missions I think Rex was always there. <laughs> My main missions was pretty much entirely Rex and Garrus. Like, I've got a bunch of, like, screenshots and everywhere I'm going where it's a main mission, you know, like, Noveria, Pharos, um, Theron, not Ilos, admittedly. Ilos, I brought Caden. Um, but, like, all the other ones, it was always Rex and Garrus because they're my boys so I always brought them along it's funny because it's like they were my favorites right from the start and they were my favorites right to the end I just and then that whole that bit where Shepard meets him at the bar and the Citadel DLC is so funny and he's like going he has to like get ice because he's been having so much sex to try and repopulate the croak <laughs> and he's so funny at the party I, I love him but that's what I mean it's like he's so funny but he's also like the proper like he's a proper good dad and a good man a good father of his clan father of his people a good person a good diplomat a good friend he's just everything you would want like he is like the perfect guy the perfect krogan he is exactly who you would want in your corner if you were in the mass effect world if you were out fighting the good fight in the milky way you would want someone like or not rex in your corner 100 percent. he's a great great guy and then that leaves only one. And of course, it's Mr. Calibrations himself. Who else could it really be? It doesn't matter that I romance Caden because even though Caden might be my boyfriend, there's no one that tops my best friend. And my best friend, Shepard's best friend in my playthrough, 100%, is Garrus Vicarian. <laughs> What do I even need to say? Like, everyone's favourite is Garrus. Like, is there anyone whose favourite character isn't Garrus? <laughs> he's the best character. Like, he is the best character. He's everything you could ever want. He's hilariously funny, but so droll. He's got a great voice. He's super caring. He is 100% devoted to Shepard, no matter what she does. Like, no matter what decision she makes, who she kills, who she keeps alive, he is just always behind her 100%. And like Shepard says... And it was the line that killed me and it was the line that finally broke the, the tear barrier at the end of three was when Shepard says there's no Shepard without Vicarian so you better get ready to duck. And she says, you know, if there are, he says, I don't know if Turian heaven and human heaven are the same, but if we both get up there and meet me at the bar. And she says, you know, if I don't make it through this, I'll be up there watching over you. You'll never be alone. Or I'll always have your back. I think it's different depending on whether you romance them. But she's like, she like this is the thing. This cut scene happens whether you romance them or not. She still says there's no shepherd without Vicarian. He still says that he wants to meet her in Turian human heaven. And she still says that if she does get to heaven without him, then she'll she'll watch over him. And it's like this just shows like the great friendship that they have. And like he's just he's he has the best like he has the best relationships with everyone in the team like everybody he talks to has the best conversations he has the best dialogue he has the best personality he's a badass but he's caring he's funny he's really flirty but like in a really fun way like his relationship with Shepard is like so flirty but like really fun um like the, those two are kinky bitches can i just say like caden's relationship with her is pretty vanilla but <laughs> garris and shepherd are fucking kinky <laughs> um you know he takes her up to the top of the citadel so that they can shoot cans um i'm garris for and this is now my favorite spot in the citadel 
he loves his family, he loves his friends, he loves his planet, he's a Turian but like in the first game he's not the best because like he's a bit of a space racist but he very quickly grows out of it and he learns to be a good person, he learns to fight the good fight and not think that everything can be solved by shooting it in the face and Shepard and him just have such a good relationship and no matter what she does he always stands by her, you know? He was the first one to say, even though you're working for Cerberus, I'm going to come and fight alongside you because I trust that whatever it is that you're doing is the right thing to do. And people like, you know, like Hayden believed that she was fighting for the wrong side. But Garrus was like, it doesn't, like, I know you and I know that whatever it is that you're doing will be for the greater good. I, I trust you implicitly. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, welcome back to another video and today I'm finally doing that video I've been so excited to make. So if you've watched any of my videos recently, I've probably mentioned at some point how I've been playing the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Now I'm going to make a video about my general like time playing it and my experience because I've never played Mass Effect before I got the Legendary Edition and I always wanted to and I'm going to, you know, there's a whole thing i mean everyone knows that mass effect originally didn't come out on playstation so playstation players always kind of suffered in terms of being able to play it and i never did but i always wanted to and you know that way when you've been waiting so long and you finally get the opportunity to do something and you're